good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience around the world. Uh, welcome to today's event, a virtual screening and fireside chat on Eat Safe's latest film, Food Safety, the Biggest Development Challenge You've Never Heard Of. Before uh, we dive in, I'd like to share a few logistical notes. Um, first, to ask questions or make comments throughout today's event, please click on the Q&A button on your Zoom console. Uh, second, today's event, uh, as you've just heard, will be recorded, uh, and the recording will be accessible on the GAIN website at gainhealth.org forward slash eat safe, and that will be in a few days' time. So at GAIN, our goal is to improve the consumption of safe, nutritious food for healthier diets of all people, especially those most vulnerable to malnutrition. Thanks to the generous support of USAID's Feed the Future initiative, Eat Safe works to unlock lasting improvements in the safety of nutritious foods found in traditional markets. We have a special focus on consumers and market actors such as vendors, and their behaviors uh, around food safety. Today's event will be moderated by USAID's Dr. Nika Larian. Dr. Larian is the Food Loss and Waste Advisor in the US Agency for International Development, uh, USAID's Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security. Dr. Larian is passionate about the intersection um, of nutrition, food safety, and climate sustainability. Previously, she was an American Association for the Advancement of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellow at USAID, working as a food systems advisor. Nika received her PhD in nutritional sciences at the University of Kentucky. Her doctoral research explored the effects of environmental pollutants on human health. In the USAID Center for Nutrition, she provides technical assistance and policy guidance on food loss and waste and food safety, serving as activity manager for Eat Safe. Nika is the chair of the Global Nutrition Coordinations Plan Interagency Food Safety Technical Working Group and leads on food loss and waste knowledge management efforts, including producing the USAID's Kitchen Sink podcast. Thank you, Nika. I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Richard. I'm excited to be moderating today's unique event, a virtual screening and fireside chat on Eat Safe's latest film. Before we dive in, I want to share a little bit about the rationale for today's event. About five years ago, USAID began making explicit investments in food safety. Many of these investments, like Eat Safe, were the first of its kind. Through Eat Safe, we've learned of the importance of settings like traditional markets which are a critical source of nutrition across the world and the risks they pose for foodborne disease and its impact. As the program begins to wrap up, we're better understanding the multi-sectoral approach that is required to improve food safety, which is highlighted in this film. In short, we've come to understand that tackling unsafe food provides an opportunity to maximize efforts across our food system, including but not limited to food security, nutrition, and economic development. While unsafe food is a global challenge, it prevents an incredible opportunity to improve the lives of millions, if not billions, of people globally. We are excited to share Eat Safe's latest film, which was produced by Eat Safe consortium partner, Pierce Mill Education and Media. In this film, Delia Grace Randolph, the world's leading researcher on food safety in traditional markets, makes a case for investment in food safety. Impacting billions of people directly and indirectly every year, foodborne disease is a low-hanging fruit in the development agenda to improve the quality of life in low- and middle-income countries. Feed the Future's Eat Safe highlights how the program, how the problem is immense, tractable, and has been neglected for decades by governments and international donors. Minimizing foodborne disease in traditional markets not only prevents people from getting sick, but also enables the full potential of investments in nutrition, health, 
education, and financial independence. Without further ado, please enjoy this exclusive screening of Food Safety, the biggest development challenge you've never heard of. If, if you really want to make a difference to the health, happiness, livelihoods, wealth of people in poor countries, go for problems which are huge, neglected and tractable, and food safety is that. Food safety has been very much neglected in development. And one of the reasons is that until very recently, nobody really understood how big a problem foodborne disease was. Foodborne disease is, is one of the, the commonest sets of diseases in the world. It can cause a whole range of symptoms and syndromes, everything from what we commonly think of as foodborne disease, things like, like vomiting or diarrhea, up to serious illnesses such as blindness, epilepsy, even death. It's only in the last decade that the first Estimates were generated after a lot of effort by the World Health Organization of the extent of the health burden of foodborne disease. In trying to understand the burden of disease, it's important to have a measure which can combine both sickness and death. And the common measure which is used is something called the disability adjusted life year. It's a long phrase, but basically it just means when you add up all the death and you add up all the sickness, what is the equivalent in healthy years of life lost? The disability adjusted life years due to foodborne disease are more than 42 million, which is comparable to the burden of malaria, HIV, AIDS, or TB. These diseases are sometimes called the big three. The burden of foodborne disease is not borne by everyone equally. We use an acronym called the YOPIs to summarize the most vulnerable groups, and they are the young, the old, the pregnant, and the immunosuppressed. Among these groups, children are one of the most at risk, even though globally children under the age of five years are only 9% of the population, they bear 40% of the burden of foodborne disease. The economic cost, which is usually measured in dollars, is more than $100 billion for low and middle income countries. But because the burden of foodborne disease was unknown and wrongly believed to be very low, investments in food safety have been orders of magnitude less than investments in the big three. Investing in food safety is necessary for investments in nutrition to pay off. And that's because some of the most nutritious foods, produce, fruit, green leafy vegetables, are also some of the most risky. By encouraging people to eat nutritious foods, eggs, milk, vegetables, if you're putting them at risk of getting more foodborne disease, you're investing in causing problems for yourself. Having established that foodborne disease is of the same order of magnitude as malaria, HIV, AIDS or TB, the next question is where is all this disease coming from? The great burden of foodborne disease occurs in low and middle income countries and most of this is the result of fresh food purchased from informal markets. By informal markets, sometimes called traditional markets in Southeast Asia called wet markets, we mean markets which are not modern. Public markets, open public markets, or sometimes covered public markets, where you'll find hundreds of sellers coming together to sell a range of dry goods and fresh foods. But other aspects of these informal and traditional markets are the kiosks or stalls, sometimes called mom and pop shops. These little five foot by four foot selling areas you find all over Africa and Asia. And also street food, people moving around with carts or barrows or just bowls on their heads selling food. But of course, markets vary. While some informal markets are tourist attractions because of their interest and diversity, others are more like something out of Dante's Inferno, especially those markets which are closely associated with slaughterhouses, and the slaughterhouses are often not the most modern, and the welfare and hygiene is not very good. Our challenge is how we can accentuate the positives while minimizing the negatives of these essential 
markets. It's quite clear that a relatively smaller number, number of hazards, maybe 10 or 20, cause a great bulk of the disease, 80% or more, and that most of these are microbes. Among the most common of these are some which have unfortunately become household names because of the outbreaks they've caused in Europe and other places. Listeria, E. coli, Campylobacter, Salmonella, so common in the poultry industry. In Africa and Southeast Asia, you still get parasitic diseases causing large problems. So in short, there is a whole range of biological and chemical causes of foodborne disease. But fortunately, if we could only tackle a relatively small number of those, we would reduce the huge burden of foodborne disease by more than 80%. We found that um, there were two common approaches. One was to provide infrastructure, but all too often when you provide infrastructure, hard skills without soft skills, it doesn't last. Maybe for the first few months, everything is nice, but with time, there is not maintenance, the infrastructure degrades, and it, things can actually end up worse. The other common approach has been training people. But too often it has just been telling people what they should do. Why? Because this is hygiene and you should be hygienic. And we know that just telling people to do things is not a very effective way at changing their behavior. So in the past decade, more sophisticated approaches have arisen to improving food safety in traditional markets. And one of these we call the three-legged stool approach. Called three-legged stool because a three-legged stool with only two legs will not stand. All three have to go together. First of all, an enabling environment. By that we mean that the authorities, the inspectors, the government officers should be on board or at least not hostile to informal markets. The second leg of the stool is training and simple technology for the vendors. Vendors, sellers in informal markets have been some of the most neglected people in developing countries. Farmers have received a lot of attention, households and consumers have received a lot of attention, but vendors truly are the missing middle who have been left out of the development plans. Because they've been left out so much though, they are a low hanging fruit and actually providing training and simple technologies to vendors can be rather effective. But, and here we come to the last leg of the three-legged stool, only if incentives are in place for behaviour change. And this has been the most ignored part of the problem of improving hygiene and safety in wet markets. What are these incentives? Well, economists sometimes categorise incentives as material, social or moral. By material, they mean getting more money for doing something or getting some other material advantage. Earning more money because people perceive you as more hygienic, cleaner. Incentives can also be social. That is, your image in the community changes. You have better relations with authority. You have better relations with your neighbor if you are seen to be selling safe food. Or even moral, by professionalizing vendors, by helping them to slowly upgrade, they get a higher sense of self-worth, they feel empowered, and this motivates them to change their behavior. In developing countries, one of the reasons food is still very unsafe is because too much has been left to the government. There's been this prominent idea that we must regulate our way and legislate our way to, to safe food. And when we look historically back to when food became safer in Europe and America during the 19th century and early 20th century, it wasn't the government who made food safer. It wasn't the businesses who made food safer. It was the consumers. It was consumer demand which changed food systems. This is very clearly the case in America where it was the book The Jungle by Upton Sinclair based in the Chicago meat yards which directly led to the founding of the Food and Drug Administration. In fact, Upton Sinclair, who was a socialist, he wrote this book as a plea for help for the terrible working conditions in the Chicago meat yards for the workers. But the effect the book had was to highlight the shocking unsafe and the unsanitary food which was coming out of these meat yards. 
There was so much horror when people finally found out the conditions the food they were eating were produced in that public demand and public outcry changed those conditions. We're hoping to repeat this success in low and middle income countries by seeing how consumer demand for food safety can be an engine to drive up food safety in the informal markets where they buy us. It's often said and wrongly said that poor people don't care about food safety, they do care. We've done lots of surveys and lots of studies to show that they do care. What happens is they can't always afford the safe food they want and they can't always recognize the safe food they want. The first step is in helping them recognize safe food. And the second step is when they can't have the food as safe as they can afford it, they know how to at least make the unsafe food they are sometimes forced to buy safer. We think sometimes people are making decisions without enough knowledge, and if they get more knowledge about all of the risks associated with food, and also what you can do if you're forced to buy unsafe food, and if they can be informed about these microscopic invisible germs on damaged tomatoes, which are making their children sick if they eat them, they can be persuaded to spend a little more for fewer intact tomatoes and use the cheaper damaged tomatoes in the stews. If they can learn these simple rules, they have a strong incentive for protecting themselves and their families. Foodborne disease has all the hallmarks of a priority disease. The problem is immense. Billions of people are affected every year, and it is one of the single biggest health problems. And it also affects many things outside health. So the scale is immense. Secondly, it's tractable. We've been researching food safety for quite a short time, but already we've shown that with relatively small investments, $20, $30 per vendor, we can prevent hundreds of dollars worth of disease and save lives. It's a tractable problem. And thirdly, it's neglected. Because everybody has been ignoring food safety for so long and investing in other areas, there's a huge potential to get very far, very fast, more than by investing in other areas which have had the spotlight on them for decades. I would say, if you really want to make a difference to the health, happiness, livelihoods, wealth of people, go for problems which are huge, neglected and tractable, and food safety is that. Specifically consortium partner, Pierce Mill Education and Media for producing this film. The call to action is clear, and this film checks the box when it comes to raising awareness of this global issue. To begin our fireside chat, I'm excited to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Delia Grace and Dr. Augustine Okurua. Dr. Delia Grace is an epidemiologist and veterinarian with 20 years of experience in developing countries. She is a graduate from several leading universities, including the National University of Ireland, Edinburgh University and the Free University of Berlin and Cornell University. She is a professor of food safety systems at the National Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich and leads research on zoonoses and foodborne disease at the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya and the CGIR research program on agriculture for human nutrition and health. Her main research focus is on food safety in the domestic markets of developing countries. Research interests include emerging diseases, particip participatory epidemiology, gender and animal welfare. Her career has spanned the private sector, field level community development and aid management, as well as research. She has lived and worked in Asia, West and East Africa, and authored or co-authored more than 200 peer reviewed publications, as well as training courses, briefs, films such as this, articles and blog posts. Second, uh, we have Dr. Augustine Okurua is a seasoned food technologist and post-harvest specialist with over 25 years of experience in applying the principles and theories of science and technology for training and capacity building, developing and improving food products, manufacturing processes, food safety and quality assurance systems, 
regulatory affairs management and packaging development. He has worked as a post-harvest researcher at the International Institute of, Institute of Tropical Agriculture for over 10 years. Thereafter, he held various management roles in the food industry in Nigeria Evans Medical, UAC of Nigeria, Flour Mills of Nigeria, and Glasgow Smith Klein Consumer Nigeria before joining the development space in 2016. Augustine is a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Food Science and Technology, and he is currently the head of Eat Safe Country programs at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. So welcome, Augustine and Delia. I'm excited to transition into the fireside chat portion of, of today's event. And my first question is for Delia. Can you shed light on the importance of traditional markets and how they're often overlooked by development efforts and the impact this has had on food safety? In the film, you mentioned the, the big three. Can you elaborate on how the burden of food safety is comparable to the big three and are there food safety efforts working to address these issues? Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be with everybody here today to talk about this, this important issue. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, when you look at low and middle income countries, sometimes called developing countries, the global south, uh, where I've lived and worked for, for the past several decades, we find that most food most fresh food is sold in what we call the traditional or informal sector. The informal sector has many different definitions. In food safety, we usually mean the sector that escapes uh, formal sanitary inspection by the officials. That means basically there is no there is no guarantee that the food there is safe because it's not being it's not traceable and it's not regularly being inspected or checked. This traditional markets, I mean, the, the classic one is just a large uh, grouping of stalls in a maybe within four walls, maybe with a roof over it, but without a cold chain, often without electricity. But by traditional informal markets, we also include small kiosks by the side of the road selling food, uh, small eateries, restaurants, and people just walking around selling food door to door, as well as food being sold from the farm gate. Put together, these constitute the uh, informal or traditional sector. And we estimate that in the global south, more than 80%, in some countries, nearly 100% of fresh food, that's produce, fruit, vegetables, animal source food, fish, is sold in these traditional markets. And given that most of the burden of foodborne disease comes from fresh foods, it's not surprising that most of the burden of foodborne disease can be directly linked to traditional markets. Thank you, Delia. Augustine, you clearly have a lot of experience working in the research, private sector and development um, sectors of Nigeria. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts on how food safety ranks amongst other pressing issues regionally, nationally and locally. Can you exemplify if and how countries are taking action against the challenge of food safety amidst other development challenges? And what approaches have governments taken to support traditional markets? Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be part of this. Uh, for Africa in particular, food safety will continue to play a significant role in Africa's agricultural food system transform transformation. Now, food safety, like uh, Dr. Delia said, had been at the background, but it's gradually having some significance coming out as a necessary factor for the achievement of food security and nutrition security. And at the regional level, at the African level, some steps have been taken in recognizing the importance of food safety. Therefore, uh, in 2022, the food safety strategy for Africa was launched. And then we also have the African Food Regulatory Authorities Forum, which just had a meeting between the 11th to the 13th of October, uh, uh, this month of October in Cairo. And it is expected to actually lead to the establishment of 
the African Agency for Food Safety. Then, of course, we had a Cairo Declaration of Food Safety during the AFRAS meeting, and that was uh, uh, signed onto by 38 of 55 African countries. That's just to uh, let us know how the, this uh, is beginning to have some traction. But the question is also that we have previously a, a Africa Food Safety Index, which normally is uh, included in the biannual reviews for African Union. So together, these activities already is showing that food safety is important. The second part of it that I want to really uh, speak about is the AFCTA, the Africa Continental Trade Area Agreement. Food safety is critical for that to actually be really functional and beneficial to the African continent, including the, the African countries. Because without food safety, the countries that don't have a food safety act, they don't have a competent authority uh, of, on food safety, it, it will be an issue. Currently, not every African country have a food safety act. So at the national level, we still have gaps in many countries not uh, operationalizing a food safety act that will enable the consequent regulations to monitor uh, food safety. The informal, the informal sector has been left out previously. The, the former sector have had regulations uh, uh, on food in terms of manufacturing, in terms of uh, marketing and so forth. But the traditional market, as far as Africa is concerned, had really not had that particular in interest uh, embedded in the food safety approaches. And that is why the IFSA project is actually unique. And, and the film we just we just watched highlights that, that as of today, there's still much to be done to enhance food safety implementation at the informal sector. And that is a shared responsibility between the government, the consumers, and every atom in the food system approach that we intend to lead to transformation of the economic growth of Africa and the sub-regional country. Thank you. I'd just like to quickly add on to uh, what Dr. Augustine said. Uh, the, the, the work on burden of disease has shown that Africa has got the most intense food safety problem in the world. That is, it has the highest per capita burden, per person burden of foodborne disease. However, in some ways, Africa, the African region, has got one of the most uh, propitious high-level political environments for food safety. We've been looking at strategies for food safety globally, regionally, nationally. And as, as Dr. Augustine mentioned, just last year, the African Union adopted the food safety strategy for Africa, which really highlights the traditional informal sector. And it's the only food strategy globally or nationally I've seen that does this. So Africa is really poised to take leadership in improving food safety in domestic markets and, and setting an example for the rest of low and middle income countries. But we know that it's not enough to have high level regulation in place. There is this constant regulation implementation gap. So now the challenge for us all, and, and with the help of donors, including some of the more uh, the more advanced and, and foresighted donors like USAID, is to help Africa close this regulation implementation gap so that from having the highest per capita burden of foodborne disease, it can move to a future with a, a low negligible acceptable burden of disease. Thank you. Thank you both for really setting the stage of both the challenge and, and the opportunity for food safety in Africa. And thank you, Augustine, for summarizing some of the exciting momentum, such as the food safety strategy and the potential of an African agency for food safety, and of course, making those important connections to trade. Delia, my next question is back to you, and I'd like to hear more about the three-legged stool approach to food safety. How do each of these legs, the enabling environment, technology and training, and behavior and incentive support the overall goal of safer food, and what are some of the challenges in implementing them simultaneously, and where do consumers fit in within this model? Thank you. I, I mean, as I mentioned, it's really only in the past, I would say, 10 years that the 
great importance of foodborne disease, of food safety in mass domestic markets, these mass domestic markets, which are mainly supplied by traditional and informal food systems has become apparent. At the same time, there has been various interventions have been tried to improve food safety. And we spent a lot of time both trying our trying interventions ourselves along with, with partners uh, and also reviewing through systematic literature reviews and, and other methods uh, what has been the lessons learned from previous attempts to improve food safety in low and middle income countries and elsewhere. And one of the main finding from this, this our own research and the research of others has been that many previous interventions did show temporary and short-term improvements in food safety, but very typically there was a failure to show sustainability or scalability in the approach. You had these little islands of excellence, but no real transformation in food safety. As we sometimes say, pilots never fail and pilots never scale. So what can we do to get sustainable and scalable improvements? And this is where we believe three things, we can get food safety if and only if these three things come together. First is the enabling environment, which means the officials must be on board or at least not hostile. And there must be a certain minimal of minimum of infrastructure. Even in very poor environments, you can improve food safety. But, but if you're literally selling food safety on a garbage, selling food in a garbage heap, which some people are, well, obviously it, it's rather hard to, to get that safe. So the enabling environment must be there. Along with that, the, the actors in the system, which is the people who are selling food, producing food, moving food, food around, uh, they must have a certain basic capacity. And we think of that in two terms, both of training and simple technologies. Training should be adult appropriate, attractive, simple rules of thumb, easy for people to take on board. And the technologies can be quite simple. Even things like a thermometer, which tells you whether food has reached a safe temperature, uh, fly screens to keep flies away from settling on your meat. It doesn't have to be even as, as expensive or complicated as a cold chain. Simple technology can improve food safety. I would say these are the things which are probably the easiest to get. We have a lot of experience in, in training and even appropriate technologies. Government, if they can, officials, if they can be provided with the evidence that this will actually benefit people's health and livelihoods, they're often willing to come on, on board. But the most neglected element, the third leg of this stool, has been the motivation for people to change their behavior. Too often in the past, it's simply been assumed if we tell people what to do, they'll do it. Well, humans are more complicated than that. We need to actually work on behavior change. And here there are many different ways of doing this. We sometimes talk about incentives, as I mentioned in the film, which isn't just about people getting more money, although getting more money is a powerful incentive. It can also be about changing their status, changing their role in society, their relation with authorities, the feeling of uh, the feeling of that they are giving back to their community and that they are regarded in a higher light by their community. Those can all be incentives. We've also been looking uh, more recently at this idea of nudges, this sometimes called choice architecture, which is by saying just making simple changes in the environment, you make it easier for people to make the choices they want to, but sometimes there are barriers in the way. In nutrition, we see this, for example, in school canteens where you can put the healthy fruit and veg, fruit and salads right at the front of the display cabinet and the unhealthy biscuits and, and cakes at the back of the, the food displays. But in, in food safety, we can also do this by changing the ar architecture. So those are the three legs of the stool. It sounds complicated, but we really think if we put these three things together, and we've shown it, and, and GAIN is showing this in, in its projects in Ethiopia and Nigeria and elsewhere, that if we can just address these three things, the enabling environment, the technology and training, the motivation for behavior change, we can get safer food. And just quickly, because I, I know time is ticking, 
one of the most powerful motivations, which I hadn't mentioned, is the consumer themselves. The consumer is king. The consumer wants safer food, but it, the consumer doesn't always know how to get it. So if we can empower the consumers to recognize what is safe food, we think this can be one of the most important motivators for all the other actors in food systems to change their behavior to satisfy the consumer. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. Certainly, I think one of the things that makes Eat Safe unique is, is the focus on consumers. But as you said, simply knowing what we should do or shouldn't do um, isn't often enough to, to change behavior. Back to you, Augustine. Um, as Eat Safe's head of country programs, can you provide insights into the unique challenges faced by countries in ensuring food safety in traditional markets? And how do these challenges differ for more developed markets and what are the opportunities to address them? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for food safety in traditional markets, the key constraints also revolve around the tripod that Dr. Delia just discussed about, the enabling environment, the regulations and policies, and the biggest challenge of them of is that the policies are usually at the national level. And you don't have those, for example, in Nigeria, at the national level, we have a national policy on food safety and its implementation strategy or plan. Although that is still awaiting validation, but getting that to the state government level and from there to the local government that are in charge of the traditional markets, getting those policy domesticated at the local government or county level or or municipal level is one of the biggest challenges we have. Just as we had the African food safety strategy, how does that cascade to national strategies and sub-regional strategies? That's one of the biggest problems. To ensure that the real, the real people, the consumers that are resident in communities, that the, the, the government agencies that actually con that actually support their existence have that, those policies and activities may stream into their day-to-day -day plan to improving livelihoods, improving infrastructure, the enabling environment, and access to the market. So compared to the developed countries, they are much more organized because they have the capacity for enforcement. One of the biggest lacuna we have is this lack of enforcement of food safety le legislation. It's one of the biggest problems we have. And because that is also require uh, capital or expenditure to be able to deliver the human capital to provide that enforcement regulation, monitoring, the problem becomes a year-in, year-out problem. When national budgets are made, when, look, when state budgets are made, when county budgets are made, th there are no specific provisions to address issues of foodborne disease surveillance, to address issues of uh, improving market infrastructure to deliver safe, nutritious food. So the opportunities we have is with, with the evidence we are getting from Eat Safe, it's becoming very clear that stakeholders' engagement is key and very critical for interventions to have impact. Because Eat Safe involved stakeholders at the beginning, and they were involved in decision making in the interventions that were implemented in the state in Nigeria. Therefore, ownership become key, very, 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 very important and easy for. It was easy for us to achieve. So that is an aspect that we need to pay close attention to involving the, benef the, the, the participants or beneficiary in decision making. And that was why we use the human center design to involve the stakeholders at, at initial during our planning and also in the implementation and continuation of the project activities. Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. We have five minutes remaining in the fireside chat portion before we open it up to Q&A. I'm going to ask one more question directed at both of you. I know we don't have a lot of time, so maybe just two minute highlight answer, but I think it's an important um, question to address. And that is how does, if, how does ensuring food safety impact the financial independence and empowerment 
of women? Are there specific strategies tailored toward women vendors to ensure they have the necessary training and incentives to sell safe food? On gender, what we did was to ensure that uh, even from the stakeholder engagement, we deliberately ensured that we had women representatives, even at the decision-making uh, session, even during the human center design, women were represented. And in the implementation of activities, we also ensured that women were actually involved in uh, activities. In terms of training, we also ensured that we, uh, we invited women to be part of the trainings. And in terms of one of the interventions, the safe food stand in the marketplace, we ensure that the consumer educators that we hired were also female, uh, at least at least 50 to 60 percent female to actually uh, respond to consumer visiting the stand. And in one of the other interventions that we did, uh, the, the, the Association for Promotion of Food Safety and Improved Nutrition, the leadership, the state management team, we also ensured that we had 40 percent minimum um, women as part of the leadership. And in conducting training, because uh, by the Northwestern region where we are, where, where we are we're working, we know that women had uh, less access to education. So we also ensure that the training is done in their local language. We, all, we, we, we ensure that most of the trainings were done in local language, including practical demonstrations on personal hygiene, hand washing, and the rest, and it's done in local language. And one of the other aspects that we actually took women into consideration is the uh, value addition. We, uh, we also involved uh, in the training of women in soya bean processing into soya milk, soy cheese, and Tom Brown, which is a local breakfast cereal. And that is for their own uh, 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 livelihood and also as opportunities for business. And this was done under hygienic conditions so that the, the, so that the women understand how best to, at the same time, provide safe nutritional food for their household and also be able to tap on it as opportunities for increasing their income as a, a side business. So we we, we, we embedded uh, women uh, in, in the project up initial and it has been very helpful and we have seen the impact already. Thank you. Thank you both for um, that this great discussion we've had during the fireside chat portion. And now we want to hear from our great audience. We've had a lot of good questions coming in through the Q&A. So please continue to add your questions there. As Delia said, if we are not able to get to them during the Q&A portion on this call, we will make sure that they are addressed on the GAIN website. So I want to start off with um, two questions focused around narrative shifts. Um, the first being, how do we bring a cultural change amongst consumers? Many of these countries believe that food is freshly cooked and that uh, processed food is not common or affordable. So can you talk about narrative shifts among consumers and, and how do we get uh, elevate the, the need for improved food safety? Yes, I mean, one of the things uh, which food safety uh, scientists or experts often say is, what people worry about and what makes them sick and kills them is not the same. There is a huge amount of misperceptions around food safety. For example, people often think that if food is boiled thoroughly, it will be definitely be safe. Uh, that's unfortunately not always the case. Cooking thoroughly is, is very important, but certain toxins and, for example, antimicrobial residues are not destroyed or denatured by boiling. So one approach is simply to explain these myths and misperceptions to people. And people are often quite interested in hearing about myths and, and hearing, having their assumptions challenged. People, especially women, like to know about food. They're very interested in food and in the health of their families. So one way is just to, to get information across in attractive ways, not 
purely dry facts, but increasingly using things like social media, WhatsApp, Facebook, all of these, these new ways of communicating with people. There's also uh, what we call edutain edutainment, which is this combination of education and entertainment. Uh, uh, things like social marketing, for example, we, we've just finished one uh, food safety project in Ethiopia where we used highly popular local comedians who did jingles and shows and, and little sketches about food safety. And this actually was immensely popular. You can Google it on YouTube about um, safe tomatoes in Ethiopia. So yes, there are many ways of changing people's way of thinking about food safety, especially if we move away from our old fashioned, just telling people educational model to a more entertaining people and interesting people model. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. You've, you said part of what I wanted to say, but I'd like to add that to bring a cultural change, you have to start from where the people are. Meet them where they are. Meet them where they are. Understand the context. Understand the customs and traditions. And use the same context of tradition and custom to explain food safety to them. That also where the aspect of using the language to explain food safety to them in a simpler form makes sense. So to bring that uh, among consumers, one of the things we have done was, for example, is that for the food safety for the radio show we've done, which we also which we also uh, tagged uh, uh, CNN Gary, we have. Uh, on their personalities come in to discuss some aspects that is not directly food safety, but in the course of the discussion, food safety comes in, and then we have calling, uh, people calling to ask questions, and then during the process of engaging with the with the with the audience, with the consumers, we pass across very critical message uh, messages on food safety, including personal health, personal hygiene, and because that personal hygiene is one aspect that of cultural change that is very important i've had to shut i have to shut down a whole factory before because of personal hygiene so meeting them where they are understanding the context is for me a critical element to enabling the consumer to understand their own uh, shared responsibility to ensuring safe food we also inform them when you buy safe food from the market how do you handle that food at home? So that's a kind of the information. You meet them where they are. They buy the, the, the food from the market. They take them home. We tell them, what do you do with the food at home? How do you store them? How do you handle them? What, what should you do? This is the context that, that, that we use. That um, food must be eaten fresh, freshly cooked. I can tell you, with the increasing costs of, of, of uh, cooking gas and everywhere, People will also like to be using frozen storage if they have the opportunity. But at the at the local level, they may not have that luxury. We have also, for example, used the same tactics to train uh, uh, vendors who are also consumers on how to preserve, for example, leftover meat they could not sell using ice block where they don't have a, a, a freezer. And these, these are things that you meet them where they are, and it makes sense to them the following morning when they see their product is still is still very fresh. That is the approach uh, that we, we, we think we continue to have that impact of shifting consumers and also reminding the consumers that they have a responsibility to ensure that whatever they either produce by themselves or purchase from the market, it is their responsibility to, to prepare it, and it is so that it will not cause adverse health effect to them when they consume it. Thank you. Thank you both for highlighting the importance of consumers and some of the unique ways um, of how we can meet them where they are, as you said, including the radio show, which I know is, is very popular. We have several of our participants that are interested in narrative shifts among governments, asking some government officials argue that in countries where there is a concern of food security, talking about food safety is a luxury. How can we encourage and influence government officials or high-level decision makers to prioritize food safety and invest in essential infrastructure for low- and middle-income countries? Yes, I think if I was talking talking about myths, I think this is is one of the myths that that there are trade-offs between uh, food 
food security and food safety, or that food safety is something which has to wait. In actual fact, food safety, even by the definition, food safety is an essential part of food, food security. Um, as I mentioned in the film, part of food security is encouraging people to eat fresh, nutritious, not ultra processed foods, things like produce, eggs and milk. But these are also the most risky foods from a food safety perspective. So if we encourage people to eat more of them and yet they're not safe, we can actually be making health worse, not better. So I think governments need to see the evidence that actually the health burden of foodborne disease is huge and WHO, World Health Organization, has this evidence. And in fact, they're, they are now updating and repeating this study, which was released in, in 2016 and showed that the burden of foodborne disease is the same magnitude, the health burden is the same magnitude as that of malaria or HIV AIDS or TB. No government in Africa is ignoring HIV AIDS or malaria. So if we can show them this evidence, uh, then I think it will help realize that the importance of food safety. But the other thing, and, and just quickly, is the evidence that food safety really matters to consumers. USAID did one study in Vietnam, just a typical Southeast Asian country, and their food safety was the number one concern of the public, higher than roads, higher than education, higher than all of the other issues they asked them about. Governments care about electors, and if governments can be shown that their electorate cares deeply about food safety, then I think governments will also start to care more about food safety. Thank you. Thank you, Dela. For Nigeria, and uh, maybe representing other countries, the reject of Nigeria uh, commodities in the European and American markets due to poor food safety is a clear call that apart from uh, losing resources, losing money, that tells the government that there's need, you need to do something. For Nigeria, that led to uh, setting up the Zero Reject Committee to, to address that. But the key aspect is the local food consumption. Providing the evidence over time that football disease is an issue. For example, in 2018, we had over 173 million cases of diarrhea episodes in Nigeria. This is information that needs to get to the government. And if the, the, the ministry department and agencies that this information get to, their engagement with the uh, uh, development partners, their engagement with research and academia, with civil society is key to, high, to, to heighten this. And then the involvement of the legislature which is an aspect that have not been fully uh, uh, optimized, is key. The legislation, the National Assembly, for example, the House of Rep, when you when we send bills to, well, or when we send bills to those uh, to, to them, who is there to push it forward? Because if the if it doesn't get if the policy doesn't get approved, if the legislation is not passed into an act, there will be no enforcement enforcement by regulatory agencies. So it's, it's become very critical that we we have to also involve the legislature. The, polit the politicians also need to be involved in food safety. Now we need to actually actually also be talking to the politicians so that if when they get to office, they also have to remember that even themselves, the food that they are served uh, at their party meetings needs to be safe. The food that they are served at the Senate or the House of Rep need to be safe. And when they go out for, for activities, either for uh, uh, ceremonies, birthdays and go, they, are, they also become conscious. So I think by the time we leverage the full spectrum of, of stakeholders and actors that are involved in, that should be involved in food safety, the government itself, for example, in Nigeria, that did a quick survey of foodborne disease surveillance in just four states. And the Federal Ministry of Health saw what was actually on the ground, some of the great gaps. That information, we need a voice. And that voice we have to come from the consumers as well, the civil society, the development partners, and donor agencies. Thank you. Thank you both for those responses. I've, I'm reminded of, of two of our slogans or sayings, one being there is no food security without food safety, and the second being if it's not safe, it's not food.
I know we're coming up to the close of our Q&A, but I have one more question that I uh, want to direct towards Augustine as a, as a follow-up to this, this um, policy conversation. And that is, do you think an African food safety agency at the AU would strengthen food safety systems across Africa? Thank you very much. In principle, it will. But the only way you can make that direct impact is the countries taking ownership. And getting countries to take ownership have to deal with it. We have to also consider the FCTA, have to consider the African Regulatory Agencies Forum. We have to also remember that they have a African Food Safety Index to consider to, to, uh, in the, in the bi biannual review of African uh, states meeting. So if we, if we link them together for accountability, Yes, it will have impact. Countries will take responsibility. But if there's no accountability attached to it in terms of the, the response by countries to this food safety strategy, they are they are domesticating it, aligning it with their own uh with their own uh, food safety um uh, strategies they already have, then it will not have the the, the intended impact. But I must say in that in principle. For the fact that it is an African food safety strategy, that 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 provide a baseline, that provide a platform for other countries that don't even have the capacity to develop their food safety strategy to actually take some of the elements of this food safety strategy and domesticate them and use them as a as, as a starting point for them to also develop their own food safety policy and food safety legislation. Thank you, Augustine. As we come to the close of this event, I want to take a moment to thank all of you that were able to join today and for your great questions. And we encourage you to continue to continue the conversation and share this film with your networks to get people invested and excited about food safety. I want to extend a very special thanks to Delia and Augustine for their insights and to the Eat Safe Consortium for the development of this film. Of course, the conversation is just starting and I know you all had so many great questions, many of which we were not able to address during our short Q&A time, but I would like to direct you to the website listed on the screen, www.gainhealth.org forward slash eat safe, and we will make sure to continue the conversation and answer your questions there. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks.